Americans across the country have taken to the streets to voice their emotions surrounding the death of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, but those emotions have not necessarily come with clear policy goals either. Activists in San Francisco said that without concrete policy goals, quote, they're worried that the energy for change from the protests will dissipate with no significant changes passed. So what should some of those goals be? How should we be looking at this movement bigger picture? Host of the Working People's Podcast, Max Alvarez, joins us now via Skype with his thoughts. It's so great to see you, Max. Hey, guys. It's great to see you, too. Hey, Max. So uh, let's start with kind of the, the big picture here. What, in your view, are these protests about? How should people be thinking about them? Well, I mean, I think I think it is the the absolute essential question. And I guess to, to kind of take a wide view and, and address what I feel, you know, a lot of people are feeling right now, what I imagine a lot of people are feeling right now, you know, I know that you're scared. I know that there's a lot going on. And, you know, I really do hope that people come to their senses and that people look deep in their hearts and realize that they have what it takes to stop this violence and destruction. And I'm not talking about the protesters in the streets. I'm talking about everyone else, everyone who's sitting at home right now and still wondering how to feel about what they're seeing. And I'm especially talking about people in positions of power, right? You know, we could end this peacefully and quickly we could change things for the better and ensure that working people aren't so downtrodden, disempowered, and, and brutalized on a daily basis. But honestly, the ones who are folding their arms and shaking their heads and sicking their dogs are the same ones who used a deadly pandemic as an excuse to give their friends billions of dollars while throwing some crumbs uh, to us as our friends and family died and 50 million of us became unemployed. You know, instead of doing anything, they and the media networks that serve them are trying to convince people at home that change is somehow disqualified because the people aren't asking nicely for it. But what I don't think these people understand is that the people are not asking. I mean, look around you. Every state is lit up with lights from people leaving their homes during a pandemic, and they are telling you that this isn't good enough, that it's nowhere near good enough. And I mean, just, just I guess, just think about what they are demanding, what people are saying they need. That's so the Max, thing is that we get, Max, yeah. Yeah, I mean, th I've, I've hear a lot of change, a lot of calls. For, what does that mean exactly? Because that's what I've covered here on the show, which is that what does it actually mean to change? What are the demands? What are I mean, this reminds me very much of Occupy Wall Street, where it was like, hey, this is messed up. But I mean, ultimately, it dissipated for this exact reason. So what what is it that the protests want? Well, I mean, I think that they are... And more than anything, they're showing the limits of, you know, just little surgical reforms and, in fact, the necessity for systemic overhaul. And that's why, you know, the police have more or less become kind of the, the center of this whole uprising, right? Because the police have been used, you know, Mark, Karl Marx famously once said that religion was the opiate of the masses. But honestly, you could make an argument that police are the opiate of the masses because they their function is to treat the symptom but not solve the problems that our social, political, and economic systems create. Yeah, right? but it's they not their job. It's not their job to solve the problem, Max. It's not nobody's asking for the police to solve the problem, right? It's on the leaders. So I'm saying, what is the that's ask of the though, leaders? That's the problem, though. Is that this is this is why it's unfair to everybody, including honestly the police on the ground, because as we have cut. So I mean, my way of answering yeah. your question is saying we need to address the problems that um, require police to, you know, um, police poor black and brown communities. Right. The problem we need to see like economic and social justice um, overhauls as part of treating the problem that we normally just rely on police to manage. We normally rely on police as a kind of after the fact solution. To, to manage the pain, you know, that our political and economic system causes. And we thus, like like you were saying, Sagar, we, we kind of push all these roles onto the police. We essentially turn police into social workers with guns. And clearly that is not working. Clearly we need better um, systems for protecting working people. We need um, systems that 
don't just look at impoverished communities and say like there's more crime there so that's why we need more police there I mean, there's also, you know, maybe there is more crime, but there's also a need for water systems that don't poison people like in Flint. There's also a need for better schools and good paying union jobs, but we don't give those communities those things. And that's the problem is that we think of um, beefing up police again as a system of pain management as the way to deal with these kind of systemic problems. And I think instead of just trying to tweak the ways that we approach policing, we need to think of the reasons that we rely so heavily on police to manage the pain that our system creates so that we can continue walking on a broken Mm. foot. I think that's really important perspective and really well said because the police don't exist in a vacuum, right? They exist within a system that has essentially dehumanized you know, a large swath of the population, which is something that we've talked about here a lot. I mean, in my view, one of the major divides in the country is between those who are treated with humanity like full human beings and those who are not. So if you are just focused narrowly on, okay, let's have everybody wear body cameras, for example, you're missing the structural issues that create the policing system that we have. I also think that there's you know, it's, it's tough because what you're talking about, what I'm talking about, is not something that you can just, like, write a law and here you go and now we're good to go. The system is so structurally screwed up that it's not that simple and easy that you can just have, like, a task force and a list of changes and here you are ready to go. But that doesn't mean the protest is invalid or that the, that fight is invalid or that it's not something to push for as a as a sort of lifelong effort to move more in a social democratic direction where people would feel their economic rights are secured, their dignity rights are secured, their basic fundamental freedoms are secured. That is the sort of radical ask at the center of this is just let's treat out, let's have everyone in the country be treated with dignity. I think that's exactly right. I mean, you know, that's what I was saying before is like, you know, I I completely understand people's um, desire and need for these up this uprising to manifest in concrete um, kind of policy proposals. And I think that will happen. I think that this is a flashpoint that will result in like budget battles on the you know municipal level, the state level and the federal level, because budgets are ultimately a reflection of the values of the society that we live in. And right now, the values of our society, as told by our budget, is to protect the property and um, profits of the wealthy and police the rest of us who are left with very little and have to resort to other means or who have to, you know, I don't know, live in impoverished areas where crime is more rampant, so on and so forth. Again, it's the it's a system of pain management, and that is what people are right now rebelling against. But I do think this will manifest in kind of concrete, um, like I said, budget battles, concrete discussions, you know, within communities about, you know, how much we have come to rely on police, how much we need to, in fact, rely on other services, whether those be community provided services, social worker provided services, economic sustenance for communities who should never have to feel this way again. But, you know, I think that, you know, the, the the desire for concrete policy proposals is kind of linked to the side discussions that we've been getting bogged down in through mainstream media, where people are trying to kind of tone police and a worldwide uprising um, because, you know, like a few, we get caught up in this like procedural pearl clutching because some windows get broken when people have been literally forced in the street to beg for their lives as if the country that obliterates towns around the world with the flick of a wrist is suddenly so horrified by violence. But, you know, again, it's it's who is, I think the, the real question is like, who is standing in the way of people collectively deciding to change for the good. So well, let me, let, me ask, are, let me ask you this, Max. Let me ask you this. If this is a protest about all of that, why do the world's most powerful corporations support it? Why do Amazon, Target, Starbucks, billionaire companies and billionaires themselves all feel very comfortable with the protests that are happening right now? I mean, you keep saying mainstream media is tone policing. I don't know what mainstream media you're watching because I see Don Lemon who's cheering on this stuff very much against any sort of increased law enforcement deployment. And frankly, like much of what you're saying just doesn't square with a lot of what I've seen. I mean, you know, 
capitalism is a hell of a drug, man. I mean, if you see this many people in the streets, if you're a capitalist, you see an opportunity to make some money. I think I think a lot of people have been trying to kind of um, make this point that because you know the the forces of capitalism are trying to sub- adopt and co-opt this language, that that somehow makes the demands that they contain invalid but the thing that i think uh, i think that's a really that's a politics of retreat it's a it's in fact you know there, there's nothing brave or noble about it what it is essentially saying is that we need to give up and let go of whatever capitalism and the establishment tries to take from us instead of fighting to take it back i mean dodge plays mlk speeches on their car commercials capitalism is going to try to co-opt everything it possibly can that doesn't mean that like the the and they're trying in so doing they're trying to de-radicalize it and absorb it into a system where it can profit from it Whereas, in fact, these, uh, you know, protests are calling for, you know, like a world in which that is not so easy. It is not so easy for the forces that hold the most of the power in our um, society to uh, sap our demands of any sort of radical potential and to instead sell them back to us, you know, like as some sort of Pepsi commercial. Right. They'll sell you the tear gas and the rubber bullets and they'll sell you the bandages and the milk to wash your eyes as well. They'll try to profit all the way around. There's no doubt about it. On this idea of where does it specifically lead, I think there's also a really important point to make. Occupy Wall Street came up earlier. And, you know, there's kind of a popular conception that, oh, it just fizzled out and it didn't really lead to much, which I think is debatable even from a policy standpoint. But also a lot of the activists and and people who were... um, who were activated by that movement ended up as part of the Bernie Sanders campaign and ended up as part of creating this new, you know, social democratic direction, especially within the younger generations in our country. And that's obviously had a profound impact on um, not only the sort of like specific political outcomes, but also in what people believe is possible and are willing to ask for and demand. You know, I, I think uh, that's a, it's a great point. And, you know, this is something that you guys have talked about, you know, all the time on your show and in your book, right? I mean, is that, you know, uh, in 2016, we were scrambling to figure out where Trump came from when, you know, we become so kind of locked into this, you know, presentist way of seeing politics because we're tapped into social media feeds where news appears and then disappears within the span of a few seconds that we lose sight of how history works, right? I mean, Trump didn't come from nowhere. Trump and the political realignment that he is a part of has been brewing for decades. The same is true of these uprisings. The same is true, you know, like of like you said, Crystal, the, the impact that Occupy Wall Street, that Black Lives Matter, that, you know, these movements that erupted during, you know, like Obama's presidency and that carried over into Trump's because the system that has caused people to feel this pain has been left unchanged. And if anything, it has been, you know, increased. Its power has been increased. And so I think that that is one thing to be heartened by. Right. Is that, you know, I, I know that people are very worried and, and people are scared when, you know, something this unprecedented. Again, it's not just every cities and towns and states, every state across the country. It's cities all across the world. Like this is what I mean when I say that, like we, we have more or less crossed the threshold beyond which, you know, like normal going back to normal is ever an option. It is not an option. There's no normal anymore. We essentially have passed the point where we have we now have two options, right? Either we collectively decide to change for the good so that working people never have to feel this way again, or we choose to give up what was left of our democracy so that the powers that be can commit the atrocities they have to commit to, as Trump says, dominate us. And I think that, you know, from Occupy to Black Lives Matter to even before with the, you know, World Trade Organization protests, there has been a lot of systemic um, disaffection brewing. There's been a lot of pain and anger brewing. And it took a pandemic and all the kind of, you know, horror that that has unleashed to really push people over the brink. And they're not going back. And I think that, uh, if anything, I hope people just realize the the gravity of the situation and realize the importance of solidarity and of believing in a kind of collective social solution Mm. to our systemic problems as opposed to just relying on the police or god forbid the military 
to, again, become the opiate that squashes this pain but leaves the broken bones untreated. Well, I think that's very well can't said. can't say I agree, but we very much appreciate your perspective. So thank you, Max. Always great to have your views, Max. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Stay safe. And we're going to have more rising for you after this.